So most of you are probably familiar with the R2P concept, responsibility to protect, um, which has been invoked in some of the situations dealt with by the Security Council last year. Uh, we felt that um, the debate deserved to be complemented by some additional considerations, which have found themselves into this paper we've circulated. And I, uh, if, for those who haven't seen it, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it because it's self-explanatory. Um, and uh, uh, I must say that I was very pleased by the outcome, um, by the um, participation today. Uh, uh, close to 30 delegations intervened, and there were um, six or seven more mm -hmm. uh, who could not for lack of time. And the way we organize a debate, it included interventions by member states mm -hmm. and by non-governmental organizations. Um, you have a list of some of the NGOs mm -hmm. who spoke. Yes. Um, just mm -hmm. off human memory, um, Human Rights Watch, Civic, um, there was a representative from the International Crisis Group, I believe, um, Mr. Gareth Evans, uh, uh, has in, in um, particular uh, written a piece entitled Responsibility While Protecting, and he has supported uh, the ideas that had been contained in the Brazilian paper, and he sent a representative today. Uh, so um, I believe that we can consider this to have been a, a very fruitful um, opportunity for us to, to look at some of the uh, admittedly very complex issues uh, raised by the uh, um, the notion that um, the international community must exercise its collective responsibility in seeking to uh, protect civilians. You know you're familiar with the R2P uh, concept which includes three pillars. Um, I suppose that the focus of the discussion uh, today and in our paper is uh, on the third pillar, the, um, the uh, possibility of resorting to um, military intervention in order to uh, protect civilians. And the essential idea here is that this should be a last resort and that um, in exercising um, uh, its um, collective uh, responsibility that the international community should be um, careful not to um, provoke more instability than the one it is uh, seeking to um, to limit or to avoid. Um, I found from the responses that I heard that uh, there's recognition that this is a, a valid point and a valid concept. Um, there may not be absolute consensus on every single one of the arguments that we presented. But by and large, there was uh, significant support and the notion that uh, this was a timely discussion. So this is uh, what I would like to share with you. Gustavo, Shakra, Julia. Okay, we will ask in English. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, do you think that the responsibility while, pr while protecting should be applied to, see to Libya? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there was a lack of responsibility in Libya after? Well, I, today I deliberately didn't refer to any specific situation. So um, the way I presented the debate, uh, I presided over the debate, was um, by um, encouraging a discussion to the extent possible in the abstract. Obviously, different delegations uh, referred to different situations and uh, had maybe different examples in mind. But our objective here is to look towards the future and uh, to ensure that um, in future situations where civilian populations may be at risk, that we will have a uh, broader international consensus on how the um, United Nations should behave, whether it is, um, and placing a lot of emphasis on prevention, actually, um, on, on the understanding that the, the best way to address uh, such situations is by emphasizing prevention by also emphasizing uh, peaceful means and um, in especially uh, challenging and complex situations where the use of force is contemplating, well also by enlarging and broadening the international consensus on how uh, such interventions should be carried out. Um, we uh, emphasize in particular the importance of the Security Council uh, fully um, discharging itself uh, of its responsibility and uh, monitoring the implementation of its resolutions in order for the 
mandates that it agrees upon to be strictly adhered to, uh, and that um, uh, resorts to military action, to the use of force, uh, not um, exceed in, in any way, uh, not, not be excessive in any way, and, uh, and remain within uh, the bounds that will create minimum uh, suffering, minimum destruction, and minimum instability. Yes. Just a follow-up to his question. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, what have we learned from Libya, you think, that might be used in the future, even if you don't want to discuss specific cases? But well, I think there's a, there's a disquiet among the UN membership um, that, uh, in the case of Libya, um, uh, a resolution that had been um, uh, intended to uh, protect civilians might have been used to uh, actually carry out a political agenda and not in a strictly humanitarian agenda. Now this is a widely shared disquiet among member states. Uh -huh. Sure, I want to Please. Ask, uh, yeah, I was looking at, your, at the concept paper uh, and mm -hmm. it says you know, you, it's the idea that the Security Council must ensure the accountability of those to whom authority is, grant, is granted. So I, it brings up to me this idea of the kind of immunity. I mean, individual peacekeepers have immunity for what they do, say, the mission in Haiti. But is there some idea, even the ICC referral on Libya exempted anyone that operated through the resolution? When you say accountability, do you mean legal accountability? Do you mean what? what well, this is something for member states to discuss. Um, but um, I, I can give you a flavor of what I, I, I have in mind. Um, for example, uh, if you have a resolution um, that um, has a, as a stated objective to protect civilians, to reduce violence against civilians, uh, and which um, uh, is uh, adopted under an arms embargo, but if one side of the um, uh, in the um, situation one is dealing with begins to be armed by uh, outside forces, you know, this would be a modification of the original resolution. So there are issues such as these that come to, uh, come to mind. Uh, there, was all, there were also some very valid points that were raised by, by some of the delegations participated today. For example, um, for how long does the um, authorization for military intervention uh, stay in force? Uh, there are other issues of accountability such as if one has difficulty in finding a consensus for uh, ending an intervention, uh, is it legitimate to take that discussion outside the Security Council into groups of friends or other such ad hoc groups? Uh, shouldn't we have a decision by the Security Council itself? So I'm just giving you some examples. Yes, over here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, while you were talking about this uh, uh, responsibility today in your speech, you also talked about preventive diplomacy. Uh, towards that end, as you know, there are these clouds of war, I mean, as, uh, as is reported, that Israel is ready to attack Iran over its nuclear uh, program. And also, that it was Brazil and Turkey which went about two years ago to Iran to somehow fend off this crisis. So now, do you think that the, uh, what is the responsibility in your opinion of the Secretary General and the United States Security Council to, to prevent? Well, first of all, I think I should clarify that this is a different debate from the one we were holding today. Um, yeah. The debate today was about protection of civilians um, yeah. in the Security Council and how to uh, develop a common understanding of the R2P concept. What you are raising is a different issue, is an issue of concern, I think, to the international community uh, and to my country as well. I have raised it with the Secretary General and um, in bilaterals that I've had with him, most recently at Davos, at the World Economic Forum. And um, I think the important thing here is to uphold the United Nations Charter. Um, and so, uh, as we know, uh, the only... Uh, the only circumstances in which uh, military action is uh, contemplated under the Charter are either through uh, legitimate defense or through a decision of the Security Council. So I think this is what we would expect from the Secretary General, that he uphold the Charter uh, in any circumstance that uh, spins out of control. But of course, we have no reason to believe that this will be the case. 
at this point, including through uh, uh, recent uh, statements that were made by high-level um, United States uh, spokesman, uh, the Joint Chief of Staff, for example, uh, who was warning against the highly destabilizing impact that such uh, a move would have. So let us continue. Um, let, let us continue working to uh, strengthen the hand of diplomacy, of dialogue, and seek uh, understanding that will prevent like military action from taking place. Just a follow-up, like in case that you did uh, in that case with Turkey, that you collaborated with Turkey to somehow mm -hmm. go there and somehow bring about something. Well, the, the Tehran Declaration of 2010 yeah, yeah, was intended yeah. as a confidence-building measure. I think yeah. at this point there's also a great deal of mistrust mm -hmm. um, regarding, uh, in particular, uh, the relationship between Israel and Iran. So anything that will build uh, or will create conditions for, um, for some confidence-building measures, I think, would be welcome at this point. Um, there have been exchanges of letters uh, between Iranian authorities and, um, in particular, the uh, high representative of the European Union, um, Baroness Catherine Ashton. And uh, let us hope that the uh, discussions uh, diplomatic discussions between the P5 uh, plus 1 and Iran can resume and generate some confidence. But again, this was not uh, exactly the, uh, uh, the focus of the debate today, this afternoon. Yeah. I have some questions about the concept paper. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I see you have a, a set of procedures, but the, uh, what went on prior with the Libya and uh, is that the, the procedures couldn't function because NATO came into it and, and people who, have a, um, who can veto on the Security Council came into it and, and so it wasn't possible to bring it up and to, to moderate what happened. So I'm wondering how, how you enforce <laughs> the kinds of things you're talking about here when in fact the political milieu in the, in the world at this moment is that NATO has a lot of power and that they also have certain power on the Security Council. And well, those with power also have obligations and have responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the international community and the United Nations. So what we're discussing here is uh, ways for, in the future, to ensure that there is greater accountability, as we mentioned, greater transparency, and uh, that decisions be taken collectively by the Security Council on how to um, implement the notion that um, military force is being used to protect civilians and not for other purposes. But how do you enforce it? What, what it has to be through a political process. It, it is necessarily through a political process that involves the procedures of the Security Council. As you know full well, there is veto right in the Security Council, so we have to work within the existing procedures. But you know, persuasion is also a very strong weapon, and uh, mm. this is the way we, we prefer to work, through ideas, through concepts, through persuasion, and through dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mr. Will you be proposing concrete changes to the right to protect doctrine then? Um, we're proposing a um, debate on how to implement uh, the third pillar of the R2P um, concept. So um, it's not so much a change as a uh, complement to what exists. Uh, so far. This is how I, I would describe it. And I think this is the way it's being received um, by the general membership. Let's say that there are gaps in, in the current thinking. And when we say responsibility while protecting, uh, the emphasis we're, we're placing on is in the fact that it's not sufficient to um, achieve an understanding um, regarding the use of force to prevent um, a situation of vulnerability for civilians from spinning out of control. Uh, once the authorization is granted, the international community must uh, use that re authorization in the most responsible manner. What does that mean? Producing minimum suffering, minimum violence, minimum death, and, and a minimal level of instability. Yes. Minister, you, were, you said that you were talking in abstract, but I guess everybody's thinking about the situation in Syria. Taking into account everything that you said, what do you think the international community should do there right now? I don't think everybody's thinking necessarily about Syria. I think people are thinking about a variety of situations. Um, 
that re relate to the Arab Spring phenomenon, but also to others in the future. Uh, so I would not have a specific prescription on Syria based on today's debate. Okay. But of course, um, I, I could um, mention briefly that we follow the situation in Syria with great concern, that we voted in favor of the General Assembly resolution that was passed a few days ago, in fact, by an overwhelming majority, that, that I'm in uh, very frequent contact with the um, Arab League Secretary General, um, and we are uh, we have been supportive of the idea for some time already, uh, several months, in, in fact, of the appointment of a special envoy for Syria. So uh, we will encourage the Secretary General to um, uh, select a name uh, with a sense of urgency, so that um, a diplomatic process may be uh, put into place that will help to. First of all, stem the violence um, and create the conditions for a political process to develop. But, like, uh, we stay on Syria. Mm -hmm. But how do you see countries like Russia that is still selling weapons to the Syrian regime, but it's legal, like there is no embargo, and some countries who are arming the position, like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and even John McCain here, the American mm -hmm. senator, is supporting uh, armed opposition. So how do you see that? Do you think that they ha must have some responsibility of what's going on if there is a civil war and some Alawites and Christians are killed by the opposition or if the regime keeps killing Sunnis? How do you see that they have this responsibility? Or? Um, I think I would put it this way. Um, uh, in the Security Council and as we um, follow I events in Syria as they unfold, uh, we have stressed uh, the importance of um, proceeding by as broad a consensus as possible on the um, on a program for the, the um, stabilization of Syria. Um, this is what was behind um, our drive to uh, um, promote the adoption of a presidential statement. I think this was around the month of August, August or September. Year. Yeah, when the Security Council was very divided. Uh, subsequently, uh, polarization um, took a hold of the dynamics in the Security Council. At the time, the Arab League had not taken a joint position on the situation. So um, today, the Security Council is still polarized, but the Arab League is um, perhaps uh, achieving a uh, a greater degree of consensus, and this is um, welcome, a welcome development. Uh, to the extent that the ideas the Arab League has, has been proposing, a joint mission, Arab League, United Nations, um, can be implemented, uh, we would be, um, of course, uh, in favor of this. Um, but uh, it, it's very important for conditions on the ground to improve. The Observer report, though, no. um, actually documented that there's an armed insurgency against civilians and the government, mm -hmm. and there's a that the observers being there from the Arab League was a good thing. It, it, people who were in the opposition and who were in favor of the government both were happy. They they spoke with them. They felt better. Mm -hmm. they, it was a peaceful situation, and yet the Arab League stopped it instead of instead of supporting it. And the UN and, and it, you know that people. Did you read that, I wondered? And sure, yeah. You well, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the Arab League, um, of course. Uh, as I said, uh, we view the fact that the Arab League is taking a more, uh, is involving itself more in the Syrian situation as a welcome development um, because it has more in-depth knowledge of the uh, particular circumstances of uh, the situation in Syria. Um, however, if the Arab League takes a decision to withdraw observers because it feels that the, the security situation or con security conditions are not sufficient for observers to be there, I, I have no, no judgment to pass on that decision. Uh, what I have been following in my contacts with Mr. Nabil al Arabi is that he is seeking some form of joint um, presence by Arab League and United Nations. And um, we would support uh, continued efforts to that uh, effect. And perhaps the naming of a special envoy uh, for Syria can contribute to the creation of the conditions that will allow this to happen. But there was just a follow-up, can I, can I, which was that the, the that observer report said that the protocol setting up the observer, league, observer um, mission was not adequate because it didn't take into account the armed insurgents that were, were threatening. This is for the Arab League to determine. 
But if it's going to be a joint uh, mission, is the, the, mm -hmm. the charter doesn't mean anything, and instead it's going to be the Arab League that, with their politics, that's going to determine. No, what it's UN the Security does. Council. The Security Council, mm -hmm. in coordination with the Arab League, will have to determine what exactly if there are conditions. But at this point, the polarization in the Security Council doesn't seem to create. Mm -hmm the necessary conditions but for such the, a decision to take just, place. Pl Please, let's have a question. Mm -hmm. Minister, like the Arab League is not like mm -hmm. the OAS, mm -hmm. like the Organization of American States, that most of the countries are democratic. Like all of them are, are, are dictatorships, but Lebanon, and Lebanon is not supporting the Arab League, actually. Lebanon is neutral in the, in the question of Syria. And also the Arab League is arming the opposition in, in Syria, as we know, the, the Arab League not, but Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And at, at the same time, they, they are supporting the regime in Bahrain that's killing also, not, not like Assad, but they're killing. Well, so you're you're making an interesting comment, but I would have no comment on your, on your analysis. No, 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 no. But like, I, I would have no, nothing to add to your analysis no, 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 other than to say that this was not what our debate this afternoon no, 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 was necessarily about. Uh, we are following the situation in Syria with great concern, not um, least uh, of which because there are Brazilian nationals there. And you have been seeing that there are um, young Brazilians, uh, dual nationals in, in places like Homs that uh, are, uh, feel threatened by the uh, rise in, vi in the violence. And we have been working to try to um, provide some measure of security for them. Uh, other than that, I think the time is for uh, renewed and intensified diplomatic efforts to achieve um, a cessation of violence. Um, Brazil has been supportive of the different uh, United Nations initiatives that do come to fruition. Of course, there have been vetoed resolutions in the Security Council. And also, I think a measure of the um, credibility that we've achieved in this regard was the fact that a Brazilian national was chosen to be uh, the head of the um, investigative um, Commission created by the Human Rights Council. Any other questions Minister, from this side? Yes. Uh, I want to know if, uh, if uh, the Security Council enlargement was mm -hmm. part of your context here in New York, mm -hmm. um, and if there's any concrete progress uh, in that, if you can already well, say when I think to some end. degree um, the impasses that the Security Council has been facing illustrate the need for reform and for uh, additional membership. But no, my presence here in New York was not directly related to that. I know that Ambassador Maria Luisa Viotti this morning made a statement um, within the context of the, uh, the yes, the negotiations uh, in the General Assembly under the chairmanship of Ambassador Tani right, mm -hmm. of uh, Afghanistan. But other than that, there were some references in the debate of this afternoon on responsibility while protecting to the fact that um, maybe uh, um, a Security Council that would be more representative um, and expanded with uh, additional permanent members uh, might be able to um, grapple with some of these big challenges that we are facing around the world in ways that um, would be more effective. But other than that, it was a very indirect reference by a few one or two delegations. Has there been any concrete progress recently in this discussions about the enlargement? Concrete progress, I think, is the fact that negotiations are taking place um, within the General Assembly. Maybe Maria Luisa, you would like to add something. You are following this uh, more closely here on a day-to-day -day basis. We have uh, very significant groups, such as the L69 meeting and supporting the uh, notion of expansion in the two categories. And I think with each passing day, as you see the G20 uh, acquiring greater um, um, a greater say in the coordination on financial and economic cooperation worldwide and um, drives for improved governance in other areas including Rio plus 20 will be hosting a conference this year in June as you know very well and uh, part of the agenda is also the environmental or the sustainable development uh, governance it becomes more uh, um, striking that the Security Council hasn't been reformed and that uh, the need for reform I think is become more urgent. But uh, the day-to-day -day debates here are slow and are to a certain degree frustrating. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, recent developments that you'd like to comment. I think that there is uh, now a very constructive uh, mode. We are uh, discussing the different proposals and there is uh, a lot of uh, convergence on the fact that uh, 
reform is urgent, we need to, to advance further, uh, but there is still a lot of um, uh, difficulty in, in trying to see what kind of modality of reform would be able to garner the necessary support. But I think that there is uh, positive engagement, uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, positive uh, involvement of all delegations, all groups, so uh, I hope that this will move forward uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you very much.